Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reich. Liberty Law Talk is featured at the online journal Law and Liberty, which is available at lawliberty.org. Today our guest is Eric Kaufman. We're discussing his book, White Shift, Populism, Immigration, and the Future of White Majorities. Eric Kaufman is a professor of politics at Birkbeck College, University of London. He's a native Canadian, uh, was born in Hong Kong, has lived in Tokyo. And he's the author of the, the previous books, Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth? and The Rise and Fall of Anglo-America. Eric, glad to have you on the program. Great to be here, Richard. So let's maybe talk about this provocative title. What is White Shift? Well, basically it has two meanings. One is sort of the meaning in, in our lifetimes, which is the uh, decline of uh, white ethnic majorities in Western countries, which I think is the sort of framing for all of the um, right-wing populism that we're seeing emerging across uh, the Western world. And then there's uh, a sort of longer-term meaning, uh, which is more that through a kind of melting pot process, the white majorities, I'm arguing, will uh, absorb through intermarriage members of other racial groups into a kind of mixed race uh, majority, but still identifying with the kind of European heritage. Uh, and so I think that's essentially a longer term process. We'll see early in the next century, but uh, in our century, we're going to mainly be uh, encountering this question of increasing, uh, well, political contestation and a, a reshaping of politics around these cultural issues related to the, a declining share of, of uh, white majorities. Now, you you contend that uh, populism, the rise of populism uh, in Western Europe and in the United States is about immigration and fear right. of a white majority of too much rapid change. When If I've stated your thesis uh, correctly, does that not in some way then vindicate those who are opposed to Brexit, opposed to Trump. Uh, I won't say Hungary because that's not Western Europe. I won't say Poland right. because that's Eastern Europe, maybe France. Um, does that, right. do, do though, do the center liberals, do the cosmopolitans, do elites then have a point? Uh, the, the, what's animating well, no, these but, movements is, is primarily white uh, racism. No, I, I think this is really very an important um, point that it is true that it is largely this cultural and psychological identity based um, motivation. Uh, but it's not, it's very important that we distinguish racism from conservatism. And the way that, that I tend to, to focus on this is the distinction between attachment to one's own group or one's own way of life and uh, hatred or feeling superiority to an outgroup. Um, in the psychological research for decades now, it's been well established. Um, and, and there's a great paper called uh, In Group Love and Outgroup Hate by Marilyn Brewer, which shows that, um, in fact, these things aren't correlated. So in the U.S., for example, I mean, they are correlated in a time of violent war, that's true, but in normal times, they're not. So, I mean, for example, if I you love my family, it doesn't mean I hate my neighbor, or, or if I'm a doctor, it doesn't mean I hate lawyers. Um, the, the, the way we can see this is in the American National Election Study, for example, white Americans who are, um, who are sort of feeling more warm towards whites on a zero to 100 thermometer, um, if anything, tend to be slightly warmer towards um, uh, blacks and Hispanics, for example, on that same thermometer than whites who feel cool towards whites, if you like. So in, in other words, Attachment to your own uh, group, if you're white American, does not make you more hostile to other groups. Uh, and, and the problem, in a way, is if that attachment is characterized as, as essentially hating the outgroup when it's actually attached to the in-group, then we get into a lot of trouble. And it's just not, uh, it's not scientifically accurate. And so it is a bit of a, I, I'm going to credit it to simple lack of knowledge rather than anything malicious that, that, I just don't think people are aware that these are different um, dispositions. And, and the other thing, too, is that it's also important that it's not just um, white majorities uh, or conservative members of white majorities, but it's also, importantly, conservative members of minority groups who are attached to their nation. 
So that whether that be the United States or Britain or Canada or whatever, um, their national identity entails a certain, not just the American creed, let's say, but a whole set of secondary symbols, whether that be baseball or the landscape or history or all these other things. Uh, and the ethnic composition of a country that they need growing up is part of that. So one of the reasons that Trump voting Latinos and Asians, for example, uh, yeah, just after the Charlottesville riots, there was a survey done, and they were as likely as white uh, Trump voters to to agree to statements such as it's important to preserve and protect the European Christian heritage of America. Something like fifty three percent of Asian and Trump or Asian and Latino Trump voters agreed to that statement, and I think that's just an indication that you also have this attachment amongst sort of conservative minorities to the country as they as they are attached to it or were attached to it growing up. So I think these sorts of um, factors are really important for understanding the populist moment. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, and I, I suppose I asked that question because, you know, many would then point to, um, say, white majorities voting for Brexit, uh, being concerned about, say, uh, you know, the argument would be, well, Muslim migration. That's what Brexit was really about. Um, with Trump, it's it's immigration, but of course the immigrants aren't Europeans, they're uh, Mexicans, or they're uh, from various countries in Asia, uh, et cetera, and there's sort of this fear there. And so that so when I, when I read your thesis, I think, well, okay, if, that, if that's true, um, and then if we look at the politics and how the politics work out, it would, it would seem to be there's an attachment that is race-driven, that wouldn't just be protective, but that would be, you know, rather exclusionary. But you don't, you think you say the research doesn't support that. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly, obviously, if, I mean, <clears throat> if you are kind of racist or deeply anti-Muslim, you know, you're probably going to be found in the populist voting base. But I think that's really a small uh, share of the population. I think it's in this sort of, you know, either the single digits or maybe sort of, you know, 10% or something. I mean, it's really quite small uh, in the survey data. And, and I think, um, I think really what this is about is, is attachment to rather than fear or hatred of, I'm not saying that the latter doesn't play any role, but I just think that the, the predominant role is, is the former. And if, if you think of something like white identity in America, for example, I mean, some recent work I've done, shows that really what that is, is it's kind of like an outer layer of your ethnic identity. So if you're, uh, if you're white American and you're really attached to being Irish or Italian or whatever your ancestry is, and the more attached you are to that, then you're going to be far more attached to being white. So it's really a kind of a byproduct of, of being attached to ancestors. And that's kind of also connected to a conservative orientation value, you know, being attached to family and, and, you know, much more extended family, et cetera. So it's kind of, and it works the same way for minority groups. If you're very attached to being Cuban, you're going to be much more attached to being Hispanic than a person who isn't particularly attached to their Cubanness. Um, and, and so it's, it's a very common thing between, you know, whether we're talking about a white uh, group or, or a non-white group, it's, I think, ultimately stemming from this identification with ancestors because that kind of transcends uh, generation and it, and it sort of connects you back in time and, and, and to a particular place. Is that it, whereas not everybody needs that kind of orientation, but the people who do, and if that seems to be taken away from them or eroding, then they're going to respond. So I think that's ultimately uh, what's behind it, and I think it needs very much to be distinguished from uh, you know discrimin discriminating against outgroups or disliking or feeling superior to outgroups, and, and, and it's that kind of fine grained conversation I think we need to have if we're, we're going to understand this and reach okay. some kind of compromise. Now, let me think. Um, also, you think about the Brexit vote. Uh, you know, the exit poll showed right. a plurality of voters, something like 30 to 40 percent. Their main concern was sovereignty. That's what they said. The loss of British sovereignty, EU law, th th which they had no control over, yep. but had to accept. They wanted to divest themselves of that. And that sparks a right. question to me of not race, but something like, you know, what Roger Scruton would call national loyalty, uh, which is, and he, he means to distinguish that against nationalism, that somehow it's, it's the love of home, it's the love of law that you participate in, that you consent to, that you accept, you're even willing to accept even if the other party makes it. 
uh, because you're loyal to this much larger conception of of the nation. And, and, and I think that's also largely true in America. And there, I think largely the fear, though, is your own elites don't respect that or are willing to divest you of your national story or, you know, accuse it of being racist or sexist or classist. You know, Scruton says that's largely been the way things have gone in the UK for decades. And there's a reaction against that. I suppose there it's primarily white majorities. Um, but of course, yep. not only yep. them. Uh, and, nope. and you talk about that in the book. And uh, I, I just may, I don't know if that, that isn't necessarily opposed to your thesis, but it's not exactly the same thing either. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to sort of, I mean, race is maybe not the right term, and I, I, I do, however, think that... You, you use the term ethno, the ethno-traditionalism. Maybe that's something to right. yeah, work in. Okay. So, so one, essentially, you know, if, if your country has a, you know, historic ethnic composition, now that's going to change, of course, to some degree, but uh, ultimately that shift, it, and ethnicity is really about subjectivity, about collective memory, consciousness, and uh, ties to ancestry and tradition, right? So over time, that can become more transracial and, and, and multi-hued through intermarriage. But I think it's the key because it's all about how much are people on the same page having a similar consciousness. And, and the more that's diversified, I think there is part of the population, um, and again, this is deeply psychological, so that, that part of the population sees um, an increased diversity and difference as disorderly. I mean, and, and this is not, you know, these dispositions are kind of half genetic. Uh, I mean, this is quite very much deep in people. So even something like, you know, people who, who's, who say that their desk is tidy versus messy, that's actually an important uh, predictor of your views on immigration. I mean, I mean, if you're more willing to tolerate a messy desk, you actually are more willing to tolerate more di- difference in diversity and there's no good or bad in this, but I think that it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, this is, this is sort of the driver. And I don't, I know you, you mentioned sovereignty in the Brexit case, but the, the issue is what people will say on a survey in terms of when asked, um, it's often, it's not necessarily the motivation, motivating factor. And, um, and so for example, if we look at what correlates, if you want to say a hundred question survey, um, with voting to leave the European Union, um, you know, amongst leave voters, 95% want reduced immigration. And amongst remain voters, it's, it's about, you know, 40% of these are 45. So it's quite a big, uh, quite a, a big gap. But more than that, amongst people who voted to leave the European Union, by far the most important issue, 40% of voters said immigration was the number one, uh, was their number one issue. And that's not even considering those that are at number two and so on. Um, and while the sovereignty is, is certainly an issue, um, you know, for a long time, Europe was simply a low priority for British voters. And even though they didn't like the EU, they, they didn't actually care that much about its, uh, you know, the different political machinations, which are not that easy to understand for the average citizen in daily life. What they did understand, however, was you know, a million polls showing up when they said there was going to be 13,000. They, you know, it's, it's unquestionably the case that Nigel Farage was able to tie this issue of immigration, which had already been risen up to number one or two in the sort of mid 2000s, already by then, uh, amongst the British public. He was able to tie that into the European issue, which had a much lower uh, priority and make the two issues seem like one. So if you were going to predict um, voting for leave, Attitudes to immigration is almost as strong as attitudes towards the European Union. And so it, it doesn't mean people are, but I really want to get away from this idea that, oh, people are being racist. No, they're not. Um, but they are attached to their nation as constituted, and they don't want to see it change as rapidly in terms of the country they know. I think this is sort of what's behind this, and I, I would really kind of caution against think, saying they hate foreigners. I actually don't hate um foreigners, it's much more a question of attachment. And, and this is a, uh, again, again, through the literature, it's a very important distinction. Um, and I think that's really what a lot of the, the politics is now uh, revolving around. But I, but I suppose, too, it's it's attachment, but it's also consent in the sense of, you know, I, I, we are required to have open borders to, to be a member of the European Union. So we, we never even had the opportunity to consent or give our voice to what's going on around us to, 
uh, you know, these changes that we see to the fact that, you know, the welfare state is viewed as a national insurance system. And yet here are these people who have come over and they're automatically entitled to it. That's true. Um, but let's just say that the pressures on the welfare state um, per se were not, were not the driver. So if you ask a question to, to Brexit voters, you know, how much of an issue is pressure on the welfare state? You'll get about a 50 out of 100 on a thermometer scale. Um, and if you just drop two words, immigrants putting pressure on the welfare state, it goes up to 75 out of 100, right? So the, 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 the trigger there is this issue of immigration. Um, not to say they don't care about sovereignty, and they, that's obviously become part of the, the Brexit brand, but I do think there's a distance between what Boris Johnson or Daniel Hannan would say, which is much more that kind of libertarian, uh, we want our you know sovereignty and we want to be global Britain. That I don't think really represents where the base, if you like, of the of the Brexit vote is, uh, or at least the motivations. I think that there is a common commonality around sovereignty, but I don't, I really don't think that. If I was to say what is what actually drove us to 2016, uh, I, I don't think the data would back up a, a predominantly political type of nationalism. It's more of a cultural. Um, type of nationalism, but but of course it's linked. And in the EU, obviously, with free movement means that Britain couldn't control its, its influx. So yes, in that sense, um, politics is implicated. Well, yeah, and I mean, I think you make this point in the book, uh, conservative government in Britain in charge since 2010, their voters wanted reduced immigration, yet that was never achieved. Part of the reason I assume why it was never achieved would be EU membership, and so voice consent politics never actually being allowed to work. That, that seems to also tie in though. Maybe we can talk about, you have this term left modernism and right. And you, you talk about the origins of that. Maybe we can discuss that, but then how it comes to be sort of the dominant mode of thinking about uh, political membership in the Western Europe and in, in the United States. Um, and, and of course, when it's, when yeah. it's dominant though, um, and people aren't able to have <laughs> conversations and talk the way you and I are about this sensitive issue, what happens? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, so this is where it's often people find it hard to make the connection between um, what's happened on the left, particularly with the sort of you know, political correctness and the, the sort of identity based left and the rise of the populist right. And so one of the arguments in the book is that these are quite intimately connected. And, and the way they're connected in Europe, for example, is that the uh, the taboos and norms around discussing immigration, um, which emerge sort of through the, in the post sixties period, particularly in the sort of eighties and nineties. And, and, and this shuts down, um, debate over immigration levels in different settings. Uh, and so for example, um, and, and Germany is probably a, a great case for this where, and Sweden is another example of where, you know, if you take Sweden in 2013, the immigration minister tried to raise the question of, of, the levels of immigration in Sweden and was kind of shouted down kind of as a racist by the media and, and other political parties, which meant that this issue was not discussed. And, and so if you imagine, you know, um, if you're a department store and you're only selling one pair of pants and people are demanding four or five different colors that you're not providing, who's going to pop up to provide that? An outsider. And that, that's exactly what the Sweden Democrats were, if no one's going to discuss immigration levels, then there's a market opportunity for, for mm -hmm. a kind of black marketeer, which is, and that's, that process it's happened time and time again, Germany, the same sort of thing. AFD was the, the first party to really uh, talk, you know, own immigration, talk about that. Once they do that, then the center parties say, okay, well, actually maybe we need to talk about this, right? So they're, they're kind of following the lead of the populist right. Uh, in, in the U.S. case, I think it would be similar. Trump was kind of the only one of the 17 primary candidates that would make, was making immigration central um, to his pitch. And, and I think there again, within the Republican Party, up until about 2016, there was a kind of taboo around making this issue kind of the central one because it's still, there was still that sense that that's the kind of racist thing to do and it's a violation of a taboo. Um, so I think this idea of taboos that, that emerged in the elite institutions as a result of the rise of a, the identity left, which is able to institute, uh, you know, a definition of racism, which is much broader than what most people would consider racism to be. But therefore, it means that in polite 
company or in these institutions, you don't make these arguments, but then who's going to make them, right? So mm-hmm. it, it opens the field for an outsider to make those arguments. So that, that it's, not, it's not necessarily a direct effect of, oh, we hate political correctness, therefore we're voting for, for Donald Trump. Now, it is true in the U.S. that that actually is a separate and significant motivation. But in Europe, that was not, I haven't been able to find that, that direct a connection. Um, so in the U.S., you've got both this kind of black market uh, um, phenomenon where Trump's the only one talking about a taboo issue and you have a direct, uh, uh, you know, people are directly uh, going against political correctness by voting for Trump. So, yeah, I think that these connections between what's happened to, on the left and the rise of the populist right are, are I think, very important. But this, uh, this idea, though, of left modernism, that, I mean, yeah. just, so we're kind of talking about a um, consequential political effect of it, but maybe talk about that and what it in fact thinks about right. the countries and, that it inhabits, its, you know, its denizens and, and Western civilization and how that sort of plays out here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very important, I think, for us to, to, to realize that we are living through a time when uh, a quite distinct ideology is at, its, at the peak of its influence. So this is not socialism, um, as in the old Marxist, uh, you know, proletariat class consciousness, it is identity based. It's about race, gender, sexuality, uh, essentially as sort of sacred categories. <laughs> and um, therefore, the whole storyline of this identity is different. It emerges really, its roots go back to the early 20th century, um, where you started to see. Uh, a number of intellectuals like Randolph Bourne in America. It starts out actually in America with the first waves of European immigration. These intellectuals, first of all, want America to become a sort of cosmopolitan country comprised of many different nationalities, almost like a precursor to world peace, that, you know, if these groups can all come to America and uh, form a little federation, then that can be, a, a you know, the world's then going to have world peace. So that was kind of some of the thinking in the sort of 1900s, 1910s, and then, Later, you get this idea that, well, once you had prohibition of alcohol and you had the Immigration Restriction Acts in, in the 1920s, a lot of these intellectuals, who were themselves mostly Anglo-Protestants, but they were of this cultural left. It's that cultural left which is emerging, and they were saying, well, uh, there's something wrong with our culture, and we reject our culture. So this idea of a counterculture and that's critical of, of your own group, your own ethnicity, your own nation, um, really emerges strongly in the 1920s. And that, that becomes a leading part of the culture right through to the 1950s, the beatniks, and, and into the 60s, when it then um, becomes a much more mass movement, uh, a much more of a mass movement because of the expansion of universities and television. How, how does, uh, um, and you see... You, you talk yeah. also about the Frankfurt School here as well, in America, having a huge influence. Yeah, well, the, the Frankfurt School, I think, I mean, it's Marcuse, for example, who, yeah. who talks about this idea of repressive tolerance and, and the need to sort of not be tolerant of illiberal, what they would consider liberal views. I still don't know that the Frankfurt School was all that influential in this. I mean, a number of them were actually, like Adorno was, was, was quite unpolitically correct if you actually read what he was writing. I'm not actually sure how much of this is them. I, I still think this is more of a kind of, uh, American it, based. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, yeah. I was going to say. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, Michael Anton, very very conservative writer, uh, author of the mm-hmm. fam- I- infamous or famous ni- Flight ninety three essay. Um, right. Basically, says politics he sees in the Democratic Party. He saw on campus in the late nineteen eighties as a student at the University of California Berkeley. Which which he right. he largely attributes to an outgrowth of the Frankfurt School. Uh, having an effect institutionally inside right. inside left wing thinking in America, and then finding a home in the Democratic Party. Right. I I I think that's certainly a tributary, but I don't actually think you, know, you can go back to the 1920s and read what H. L. Mencken was saying about uh, ordinary Protestant Americans as being sort of stupid and and uh, second rate, not able to produce any good, decent culture. And, and you can see that this, this attack on the square middle American whiteness is already a staple, I think, in the, in the left, cultural left discourse uh, prior to the 1960s. And 
this idea of, of being against your own group, the adversary culture. I mean, Daniel mm-hmm. Bell talks yeah. a lot about this in his book, The Cultural Con- Contradictions of Capitalism. And Bell's kind of in that first wave of conservative intellectuals reacting to the student movements. And he sort of traces it back to that, that really these, and, and of course the student revolts of the 60s are the beginning of what we see. So you saw, for example, um, Black Panthers occupy with guns university buildings. You saw uh, strikes in universities that lasted a year that said, give us 50 ethnic studies posts. And then the and the leadership of the university capitulated. You, know, you saw no platforming, for example, in the, in the 70s. And a lot of these themes around racist and gender go back to, I mean, those identity politics movements were really in the 60s, the late 60s. And I think the, it's just that the scale hadn't reached what it has has today. The professoriate was a bit more balanced. It was maybe more two liberals for every conservative instead of 10, 10 to one or when, you know, the, the way the ratio has, has gone today. So what happens is the institutions like the uh, universities and Hollywood and, and, and the media and, and so on become more and more saturated. So the, you can see on a number of graphs in my book, the, the professoriate, for example, the way that shifts over time. You can look at political donations in in, in you know media in tech and, and that all shifts over time because they're mar- you know the baby boom 60s children and their children are, are kind of bringing these ideas into these expanding institutions and gradually taking them over kind of a march through the institution so I kind of see it as a now of course you do get new innovations like the trans issue and, and um, homophobia kind of comes in, in a little bit later after racism and sexism but um, I still think the bottom line here is about sacralizing disadvantaged race and gender or sexuality groups. That's sort of central to, and that anything that might offend in any way um, against those groups is something that you react against as, a, as blasphemy, you know? So th- this is kind of the core of this. And so political correctness, I mean, we saw on campus in the eighties, absolutely. But I, I don't, I don't think we should forget in the sixties as well that these things were already happening. So I, I guess yeah. I see it as more of a question of scale rather than a, than a, fundamental qualitative shift um and that would be sort of my take on it and you just i mean we you can think you know um you know middle class americans can ignore i mean they, they read about and but can ignore sort of certain outrages on campus um but has has been said by um, some people uh, what stays on campus at least in america doesn't seem to stay on campus and so the, then the fear becomes uh, oh my gosh um there's you know, they ban white students from going to the coffee bar one day. Uh, is this now behind, say, the deplorables comment of Hillary Clinton? And, you know, could this be coming much larger? Um, why would you allow certain people to be school teachers uh, or to vote or things like this if they are, in fact, um, deplorables? And, and so this sort of, in a way, I think ties into your thesis of the, of the populist vote itself. Yeah, because... So what's happening is there's an infiltration of the kind of liberal institutions, the cultural institutions, a sort of saturation to the point where once you dominate completely in a way, you're able then to set taboos and set the rules um, and really remove all dissent. And, and, and the way, even though, I mean, most people in universities are probably, you know, most of the academics are maybe center left or liberal, but if there's no real vocal conservative section there, then, and then you get some radicals who start to say, we have to sort of decolonize the curriculum and we have to have you know, bias response teams and all these crazy things, which have led to the kind of campus insanity. There's no one left to kind of speak up. And so the center left, they don't want to be accused of being conservative or racist or whatever. And so they just keep their heads down and therefore there's nothing to resist these waves of craziness, right? And and that's kind of the, the problem within the university. But the way it reaches the the mass electorate, I mean, we're seeing it, of course, in the U.S. with it entering the Democratic Party. So it could make the Democratic Party unelectable. I mean, that is one potential outcome, and and, yeah. and certainly hand a victory to Trump. But in addition, what they do is they then make sensible decision making becomes almost impossible in. You know, it might be in literature or the arts or Hollywood, or it might be in um, in the courts. Uh, it might be in the Democratic Party, in, in all these lower levels. Like in Britain, there's a good example of 
this occurring around the um, the sort of uh, prostitution grooming scandal in the north of England, a place called Rotherham, yeah. where because it was Pakistani Muslim gangs that were running these underage uh, prostitution rackets in a way, um, the authorities in this sort of left-run council, but not only the left, but they were reluctant to investigate. They were reluctant to sort of shine light, shine a light on this. And, and really what that meant is they actually allowed this uh, outrageous behavior to, to continue um, for a long time until it finally broke. Uh, and even when a number of la- local labor party people said, look, we got to do something about this. It's a problem. They were kind of shouted down by their own party. And then that's what allows Tommy Robinson, who's kind of a a, a, a sort of far right activist in, in Britain to to make great hay out of this and to emerge. So his his emergence is really down to political correctness in these institutions. And I think a lot of uh, progressives don't see the connection between shutting down uh, debates in one part of society and something else popping up elsewhere. And whereas these these things are very intimately related. Yeah. So uh, thinking also here. Um why isn't Eastern Europe a part of your analysis? You you uh, you talk about Western Europe, Britain. You have chapters on Britain, chapters on America. Um, but why? What, what what makes Eastern Europe different? It is different. I think they've had a different um, education and cultural development. They haven't had the uh, left modernism uh, tradition of the sixties penetrate anywhere near to the same depth in their institutions and. If you look at um, populist right voting, I think it has a slightly different form in, in Eastern Europe. Um, and a good example of this is, is Germany, because Germany has an Eastern part which was under communist rule. People were educated differently from those in the West who are the same as the rest of Western Europe. Um, and if you look at support for the AFD, which is the populist right party in Germany, in the West it's about immigration, but in the East it, it's much less so. There's, there seems to be just this general effect of, of coming from Eastern Europe or, or East Germany, which makes you more likely to vote for the AFD. And I think that's just down to it being somewhat less liberal um, broadly across many different uh, parts of life. And so, yeah, I think Eastern Europe, it's also partly about this historical baggage about humiliation and occupation from different forces and sensitivities around that or, or harking back to a time uh, before liberal democracy emerged. So it is somewhat has more of that historical dimension to it than in the West, whereas the West, it's really about immigration and, and the sorts of ethnocultural changes. Um, yeah. So that's partly why I wanted to kind of focus more on that, that second phenomenon, which I think is, is um, quite yeah. distinctive. But, um, but, but what is interesting about Eastern Europe, and it's important to mention, is that it's not all of Eastern Europe that has populist Right, it's only the East European countries that are inside the European Union. So it's not Serbia or Moldova or Ukraine who are outside the European Union. It's so that's important because it's basically countries that see what's happening in the West and they don't want it for their countries. They they see that they're being told by the European Union to go this multicultural route and they they are resisting that. So I think it's partly a sort of second order, somewhat arm's length relationship to these changes um, that's playing out in the East. But again, when I say East, I mean yeah. East, Central European the, countries the, inside the EU. Not the Vis- the, so the, the Visegrad group. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Visegrad, but even the Baltic states now have got some of this as well. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you say they didn't have the influence of left modernism. They did have the influence of communism. Uh, and the, right. then the humiliation of communism, the subjection uh, that they experienced and it's sort of the recovery of political freedom, uh, which I, I think is key and the ways in which the political freedom came in, but then also liberalism itself, they view as skeptically, I think because of these values that are, that they see associated with it, that which, which they're rejecting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I, I think it really is, I mean, I think this left modernism is the key to the story. So if you look at the mention of the term racist in Hungarian or Polish or Russian, uh, and you compare that to mention of that term in English or French or German or Swedish, you see vastly different patterns between, say, 1945 and the present. So in those East European countries, 
Um, there's no big increase in the use of that term, uh, whereas in uh, or, or sexism or, you know, so you don't see this kind of left modernist discourse emerging into the popular realm. And, and that's, I think, the core of this, because then once you have that, also you have a shift to more countercultural adversarial type narratives of nationhood that are critical of, of the nation. So it might be focusing on the Holocaust in the case of Germany, or it might be focusing on, on slavery and Jim Crow in the case of the United States, or maybe a native uh, peoples in the case of Canada on Australia, you know, that, that shift to telling that very kind of critical story, um, which is coming out again of this left modernism, but they become the kind of elite yeah. of society. So they're able to, to push those narratives center stage, if you like, uh, that doesn't seem to have had the same uh, okay. trajectory in the East. Yeah. I know. I mean, it's funny as, as I'm reading your book in preparation for our interview today, I'm also reading a book called return of the strong gods, just released, uh, authored by R.R. Reno, editor of First Things. Okay. And his, you know, his analysis is the insistence that religion, uh, family, and nation, and the love of these things are all incredibly problematic in the West, according to various trendsetters, you know, largely since the end of World War II, and then with a renewed emphasis, actually, with the victory in the Cold War. And that, of course... Is, is the way in which we react. We're told to react to everything. We're told to be anti-fascist and we're told that everything is the potential, the potential racist motive or potential nationalist motive or et cetera. And we don't know, you know, we, we really don't know what, who we are anymore. Uh, he uses the word solidarity over and over again in the book. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I can, I mean, I, I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to his argument, but I see, you, you, you can really see the left modernism in that way too, that it sort of just dissolves bonds over time. And then of course, right. but then you've got open border. <laughs> then you've got, say with, with Britain, you've got the inability to control your immigration in America. You at least there's a strong perception of there being an open border on the Southern border and the ways in which, so then your immigration becomes, well, we don't even know who we are, but we've got all these people coming over and you can see the reaction that would induce. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that sounds like an interesting book, and I'm, I'd be interested too. In, in Chris Caldwell's got a book which is coming out, which I haven't read either. But I think that, yeah, the question we have to always ask is about what what actually, and this is almost a left wing or analytical tradition about social construction, right? So there's a, been a kind of progressive construction of our reality, the way we see the world. So you know, we could, just a simple example might be. Um, we never he no one knows in America about say the Armenian genocide. I mean that wouldn't be something in the popular consciousness. I mean elites might know about it, but it's not something that is in movies, in books, in the school system, for example. Right. So there's always this ch- choice about what to emphasize. Um, would we say that if some uh, legislation comes in which is pro-religion, would we say, oh my God, we're going to wind up with? you know, the Salem witch trials, or we're going to wind up in some sort of caliphate or, you know, that's that kind of a, a charge would be relatively weak compared to if you said anything say about immigration, someone might say, oh, well, this is going to land us in the Nazi death camp. You know, that, that Nazi sort of a trope is a much more resonant and popular one because it's been emphasized. So there's been this process of kind of elevating certain storylines and backgrounding other storylines to create what everybody just thinks is what's important and what isn't important. But it's important to note, for example, the Holocaust is something that, you know, and I, I, I you know, my grandfather escaped the Holocaust, so I'm certainly well aware of, of how awful it was, but it is also important to note that in the 60s is when this starts to become uh, you know, talked about a lot more and, and then you get it in the movies and so on, and that's, that's fine, but I also think it's kind of, such a dominant narrative partly in, in part because of the way left modernism has evolved and focusing on uh, race and gender themes as a sort of sacralized, uh, sacralized groups which you um, in a way cannot blast uh, and, and, and this you know really what this does is it constructs a certain reality a certain version of nationhood and tells us what things we should be focusing on what things we should be ignoring we're not going to focus on the Rwandan genocide too closely or uh, you know, what happened in Ukraine or, or elsewhere, which were more, or Cambodia, but we're going to focus on, on one set of events. Um, and I, I just think that those are deliberate choices that are made by ideologies. And yeah. so part of the problem is how to, how to put those in 
better perspective once again to, that yes, they are real problems, but we also have to focus on achievements, things to celebrate, for example, which have been kind of overshadowed by this yeah. excessive focus just on crimes, you know. So maybe here, moving towards the end of our conversation, um, you have a chapter, um, inclusive majority, inclusive majorities in inclusive nations. So uh, how, w- what do you recommend in terms of meeting these demands, both populist demands, but also demands of openness? Yeah, I think ultimately we have to reach an accommodation and an understanding between people who want uh, less cultural change and those who want faster change. That, that we, it's not about globalist traitors and deplorable races. That, that each side has to start to understand the others. And this is deeply psychological, as I, as I said, sort of 50% genetic uh, in, in terms of your disposition towards diversity and difference and change. Uh, there has to be a kind of happy medium. Um, and also that, and, and that actually because the elite institutions are con- are dominated by progressivism, I do think there's an obligation on them to, to start this process and to start to step back from the relatively religious uh, kind of worldview around left modernism and to move it to a more kind of balanced uh, empirical shades of gray type left black and white worldview. And then based on that, I think that ethnic majorities, um, this idea of the ethnic majority, I think is important. That it, yes, it's a melting pot, it's assimilative. Um, so I do think that it, it, it will continue, but this is what I mean by inclusive ethnic majority. I think that's a good thing because actually the unity of a country, the whole nation state, the whole territorial political unit, uh, is to some extent dependent upon, I, I would argue, a secure ethnic majority. It's not to say if, if you have a country that's all minorities, um, you know, like maybe, uh, you know, Mauritius might be an example, or, or if you think about Hawaii or places that are radically multi-ethnic, that's fine, but I don't think it, it's as smooth. Politics tends to say, run on ethnic lines more easily. So it's better to have these ethnic majorities uh, as long as they're kind of open and then the nation, I think without a challenge like the Cold War or being invaded, you know, some of the, just the purely values-based uh, creedal type nationalism on its own, when you're getting rapid ethnic change, I don't think is, is really sufficient. There has to be some understanding that um, you have to accommodate to some extent people who want this slower change and that that actually is also a component of the nation. That is the these secondary characteristics such as um, history, such as um, you know, ethnic composition, they're going to change, but they have to change at an agreed pace, and they are part of national identity. Um, and so we, it's going to be hard to get everybody on the same page. I think that's also an illusion. That if you, without a war or, or a Cold War ideology, it's very hard to say, oh, we're all about liberal democracy, and that's enough. You know, And mm-hmm. I, I actually think that you have to allow people to be attached in their own ways. And surveys show, for example, that um, people in England, you know, if you voted leave, you, the landscape and history matter more to you than if you voted remain. And, and also in the United States, um, if you're a Republican, things like, again, landscape and, and history, uh, and even something like baseball, you know, will be much more important in your, in your Americanism than somebody who is a Democrat for whom diversity, say, and immigration, history, alternative neighborhoods, these sorts of things are, are going to be part of their American identity. That's fine, as long as everyone's identifying to the nation. I think that's what I mean by this. It's more like a menu than, than a hymn sheet that everyone has to be on. Yes, there are common elements, but I think by being flexible and, and accepting that people identify with the nation in different ways, and that will, I think, take the sting out of a lot of this. I think one problem right now is that particularly the progressive narrative on the nation is quite dominant in many ways and is not tolerant of um, those who may identify to their nation through having many generations ancestors on the land, through the landscape, through you know a narrative like in the U.S. case, you know, Jamestown and the settlement of the West. And those kinds of um, narratives are some, maybe are quite important to some Americans, and they're going to be not important to other Americans, and I think that's fine. Where I think you have a problem is if you try and force everybody to be loving exactly the same version of history, especially if it's critical of some groups and, and not of others. I think that's a recipe for uh, division. Yeah, we hear, we hear a lot about xenophobia, 
but we never really talk much about right. oikophobia or, you know, hatred of right. your own. <laughs> and, um, or is it something people don't grow out of, don't grow out of their youthful rebelliousness maybe, but double down on it as they get older. It seems to be a problem. And, and at least it probably seems a problem from my vantage point for many uh, cultural intellectual elites. So would Canada be an example of a country that has inclusive majorities uh, engaging inclusively uh, with their rising immigrant population and uh, making things work in that regard? No, I, I think Canada's in many ways an example of, you know, how not to do it. it just, it's, I mean, there are reasons why we haven't seen as strong a, a populist right in Canada as elsewhere, which has to do with the ethnic majority in English Canada being essentially not having a historical memory because they invested heavily in this idea of British loyalism. And when the empire collapsed, there was essentially a vacuum in that identity. And, and that's been filled by, by a, a progressive narrative of, of multiculturalism. Uh, it's important to note that when the Canadian Multiculturalism Act was adopted in 1971, for example, you know, uh, British and French origin Canadians were about 70% of the population and non-Europeans were maybe at most uh, 5%. So it's not, it wasn't necessarily a, a description of the country as much as some kind of a, an attempt to get past the French English bat. And, and okay. also there was a sort of con- a, a progressive input into this, but what you've seen in the last five years in Canada now, with Canada has very high immigration, much higher than the U.S., mm-hmm even though it is legal, but what you have seen now is much wider polarization on the immigration issue. So conservative versus liberal in Canada, they're now 50 points apart on on immigration questions, whereas five years ago they were like 10, 12 points apart. So it's kind of what what happened in the U.S. between, say, 2012 and 2016 has happened in Canada in the last what's, five what's years. Driven that, what's driven that in Canada? Well, part of it is I think Trudeau has radicalized people, I mean, because he's okay. such a sort of politically correct and pro-immigration and that's, it's been, he said Canada has no identity. All these sorts of things have rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, but it's also part of a kind of general trend towards, you know, once somebody starts talking about these issues, a, a kind of latent built up, pent up kind of dissatisfaction in the, uh, you know, in sections of the population. Again, these are all the people who are, who don't, are less on the diversity and change are, are the ones who are going to gravitate to these sorts of appeals. We saw it in particular first with the election of Doug Ford as Premier of Ontario, and there you could very much see it that differences on immigration were one of the strongest predictors of, of, of the vote there. Um, and then now with, with, with some of the, the polling in terms of the federal election, which is coming up early next week, uh, and the new, you've got a couple of things in Quebec. First of all, they've elected a populist right provincial party, the CAQ, which promised to lower immigration for the first time in uh, Quebec history and also to, to outlaw um, the burqa and, and, and other religious coverings. So you've got that politics in Quebec and then in English, in federally, you now have the P- Maxine Bernier's People's Party, which is the first kind of right-wing populist party at the federal level. And they... they they're just breaking in, and these parties typically take a few cycles to get into the double digits. But I think to talk about Canada as some sort of exception is really just not accurate anymore. Oh, interesting. Um, Eric, thank you so much for discussing your book with us, Why Shift, Populism, Immigration, and the Future of Majorities. It's been great. Thanks for having me on, Richard. This is Richard Reinch. You've been listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk, available at lawliberty.org.